Stubbs, a cable TV station manager from Vancouver in Canada. For the next 45 minutes, Graham listened intently as Martin proceeded to recount an extraordinary story in which he claimed to have accessed NASA's downlink transmissions originating from numerous space shuttle missions that stretched back over a period of several years. And, amidst all of this carefully logged footage, footage that amounted to over two and a half thousand hours, Martin further claimed to have stumbled across something equally extraordinary, palpable evidence for the reality of not one, but two extraterrestrial life forms. In order to fully verify these and other equally amazing claims, Russell Callahan was dispatched to Vancouver last August to meet up with Martin in person. This is, this is Joining him would be hard. Brian Borshoff, project me, director of the Phenomena hard, Exhibition, who flew in especially from Australia. And After think, spending an entire uh, week in the, the company of Martin, I think you have engaged in for I the did. most part viewing countless moment, hours of NASA footage, flight, the staggering implications of what he'd uncovered if you're, if you're soon became apparent. To substantiate for although Martin had come across countless importance. further examples of mysterious sphere-like activity, his trained eye as an experienced TV editor had picked out something else. Something that he would find compelling. Something that others would later find amazing. At the conclusion of their visit to Vancouver, a tri-party agreement was reached one that would ensure worldwide public disclosure through methods and means that would soon become apparent in the weeks and months to follow. But why, on the strength of one phone call, did Russell Callahan and Brian Borshoff travel thousands of miles to touch base with Martin Stubbs in the first place? Call it intuition, call it good luck, call it what you will, but on hearing Martin relate his extraordinary story, he sent out a signal far more powerful than that generated by any satellite. And what better means to demonstrate the point than by having Martin recount that story in his own words. Hi, I'm Martin Stubbs and I'm uh, a resident of Bowen Island, Canada. Bowen Island is a small island of about 3,000 people just off the coast of British Columbia. The city we directly commute to on a little ferry, 20 minute ride, is the great city of Vancouver. And it's here that I was able to discover through NASA's own video downlinked from the shuttle two types of phenomena that from my estimation should not be there. The first phenomena uh, is a spherical phenomena. It's the best I can do in terms of explaining it. And the second phenomena is a phenomena that is virtually invisible to the human eye but when filmed with the CCD camera and the broke you break the video into frames and there's 30 frames per second then you split the frames into fields because each frame contains two scanned fields and it is in those fields we have discovered our second space phenomena. Uh, it's not a matter of finding something that is a reasonable doubt scenario. It's, it's, it's more about let's just keep collecting, studying, and analyzing, and eventually the jigsaw puzzle will come together, and it's finally happened. I held a very privileged position in the city of Vancouver. I was in charge of for the past 20 years, actually, uh, community access cable stations. And those are public stations that uh, use volunteers, interns, make all their own programming and put it out on the cable system. Here in British Columbia and throughout the rest of Canada, we have 90% cable saturation. So it's the equivalent of having a uh, full channel. And in my office, I had um, old log tapes from logging the station available, and they were supposed to be turned over after a few times, so I just piled them up, and I had VCRs. I had the means. And I, I talked to our technical department and asked them if they could give me my own dish. Um, and they did. And I 
set my machines and went about my normal daily life of managing two of these facilities. And I just would go home at night after each shuttle mission or each, each day of the shuttle mission and break the tape down. And I just found myself in the unique position of having the means to do it. The, I was in a position to do it. And I had all the motivation. The second the shuttle countdown began, I recorded. And I stopped recording when it was at a full stop. Right. So it, it was a pretty demanding exercise. Well, you obviously... the uh, SDS uh, 61, which is, was the Hubble Space Telescope mission, was 36, I seem to recall, 36 tapes with eight hours per tape. So these are, you know, you just had to keep going. Some flights are five days, some are 11 days, 14. The Hubble Space Telescope mission, I chose that mission, not because I knew about a CCD camera or anything. I chose it because the NASA had decided to make this the showcase mission. It is a very important mission. The Hubble Space Telescope is the very most delicate and important thing, and these gentlemen were going to spacewalk for seven days and fix it. So right. it was even interesting for me to just watch them work in this environment. And from the very first moment the, the first download came, I found our spherical phenomena. Did, did, you, did you set out to try and find the phenomena or did it start off as a, a sort of self-education exercise in, in watching the mission footage? It, it was everything. It was a self-education thing. It was a curiosity that of why no one from 19, from the year 1991 till 1904 had bothered to look at any other footage. And I was quite naive and wasn't aware it was all being downloaded because I'd bought into the popular culture or the urban myth that they were scrambling at it and it wasn't available since 48. I've been an editor for 25 years as well as everything else. And I can, I, I spend an awful lot of my day looking at videotape and, and at amazingly fast speeds, reviewing people's programs for critique reasons and things. Sure. My eyes are trained and I kept seeing something. So when I started breaking the frames down, I found you still couldn't find it. You'd go from for this frame to this frame and there'd be a quick movement. So then I, I had to get a videotape recorder, an SVH machine, an older model, funny enough, not the digital model, that literally, when you rolled the thing, it would break the frames into, into fields. And in reality, there are 60 individual pictures that make up one second of video. And that's when I found them. So you were, you were finding these on one of those 60 frames? Is, one is of the, I found, in fact, the first one I found, I only found one. Right. And then I thought, well, I should be able to, if this is real, I should be able to do it again. And then I found two. And it just went from there. What should we really be seeing? How did you know that we were looking at something that was, that, that shouldn't be there, that was unusual? I mean... Uh, well, the first thing is that in my career, Usually in one second of video, no movement happens. You can, you can look at 60 frames and, you know, the way the movement goes, very, not very much happens. It's not like those flip things where the little sure. thing moves when you flip the pages. Literally in 60 of those, nothing happens. Something was happening literally between <clears throat> one thirtieth of a second and one thirtieth of a second because there's 30 frames per second. So it was just sort of a, let's look at this and, and it, when I found it was in a scan field, and then it, the way it works is it scans and scans very fast. But the phenomena seemed to have disappeared by the second scan. So it was moving very fast. Very fast. So having, being a manager and being in charge of a television station, part of my staff is a technical staff. So I started consulting our technicians on to, to, to destroy my my uh, discovery, I wanted them to to to, to tell me that they. You wanted to hoax. critique it as heavily as you could. I wanted them to could. tell me this this 
that somebody could fake this. You can't. Then I took the sample, to make a long story short, I eventually made it up to the scientific community and to a think tank and a behavioral lab and a physicist and astrophysicist. And they kind of, you know, just, uh, pay, you know, they just humored me at the start. By the end of our meetings, they had their hands on the control. They were running up to the screen and they were holding meetings. They broke the entire pixel, pixelization process down and found it was still there. It, it, so they really didn't expect to, to they see anything in no, the beginning, but by the time you no, finished, they were excited. I think they expected probably that we'd have more of a real-time phenomena, which, 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 which is still spectacular. And probably, I guess, that they felt yeah. they might be able to explain to you as something yes. perfectly uh, legitimate or normal. Yes. For well, you never know who's in the Skeptic Society of British Columbia. For instance, the X-Files actor, William Davis, who is the cigarette-smoking man in the X-Files, um, is a member of the Skeptic Society. So I never knew with these scientists what where they were all what they were trying to do to me sure but the amazing thing about this other phenomena the, the one you that's virtually I, I would say it's invisible although it isn't once you see it you begin to see it all the time is it blew their minds it blew their minds did and, they offer any explanation for what they thought it might be or um, are they as as uh, baffled there's a a professor at Simon Fraser, Professor Weinberg, who, who literally said it had to be what it, it had to be actually there, doing exactly what it was, but he could not. He said we would have to bring, we would have to go right to NASA, and eventually, uh, we had a lecture at the planetarium here in Vancouver by one of the Hubble, uh, Pubas, the chief chief. Hubble designers, engineers. I, that must have been a great opportunity. It was a to... great opportunity. And what was interesting is when we showed them the spherical shapes on video clips, uh, on video stills, he was comfortable, which meant, you know, he, you know, he could throw the ice crystal theory, or at, because it was a very small sample at that point. It was only the at the first time I'd ever done it. But, uh, at that point, he confirmed that what you were showing him were ice crystals, or no? He just thought that that was basically. Um, he accepted that it was a phenomena of some sort. He he just well, they're comfortable at NASA because James Oberg, who's the NASA debunker, in my estimation, had basically briefed them all that don't worry about all this stuff you see, because uh, that's just that's just all kinds of stuff you don't understand about ice crystals. Um, so, they, they, he didn't have any, you know, it was the Hubble fellow at the planetarium in the, after yes. the lecture with the head of the planetarium, um, he, he sat there comfortable, but when the still frames of the, this, uh, second, second phenomena were, were shown to him, he stormed out of the room. Did he say anything? Did he give any reason? He made some huffs and puffs and stormed out of the room. Now we found, I, I mean, it, that's very unusual kind of reversal. And we obtained, we meaning my, uh, 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 an artist friend and I, who's um, got more guts than me, I guess, in terms of walking through front doors, which we're not supposed to.